Good evening. Turn with me in your Bibles to uh, chapter 17 in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Bow with me and pray. Our Father and our God, we bow before you recognizing our sinfulness that we are creatures undeserving of your grace and mercy, yet you saw it good in your plan of redemption to set forth your son to die a death that he didn't deserve so that we may live a life that we don't deserve. I pray in this moment that your son would be exalted and all glory and honor be to his name. Father, as we look into your word tonight, we just ask that the Spirit would guide and convict us through these scriptures. And that we would leave here desiring to serve you fervently. And that we would... give you all the honor and glory due to your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So tonight, I am going to look at the atonement. It won't be an in-depth exposition of a passage of scripture, but I have chosen some selective scriptures to go through, and hopefully uh, by the uh, work of the Holy Spirit, we will leave here with a better understanding of the work that Christ did for us on the cross. It was once said by the prince of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, regarding the atonement, the heart of Christ became like a reservoir in the midst of the mountains. All the tributary streams of iniquity and every drop of the sins of his people ran down and gathered into one vast lake, deep as hell, and shoreless as eternity, all these met as it were in Christ's heart, and he endured them all. What a beautiful picture of the atonement. To define the, uh, the atonement, I'll just start with this. I'll define it this way. The atonement is the work of Christ, or the work that Christ did in his life and death to earn our salvation. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. If you would, turn with me there. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me back up just a little bit in verse 6 to give it a little bit of context. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for, the, for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18-19. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Again, Paul in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, who, speaking of Christ Jesus, gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. 
and ever. Amen. And John writing to the church and the, or the churches in Asia Minor said this in 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here, at first glance, in this uh, 1 John passage, we read the word propitiation. And that's just a long word, a uh, long church word. It means appeasement or satisfaction. So what John is trying to say, or is trying to communicate here, along with the Apostle Paul, is that Christ, atoning work on the cross, satisfied the demands of God's holiness for the punishment of our sin. Mine and yours. And so the death of Jesus on the cross propitiated or satisfied God. To give an illustration of this satisfaction, Paul puts it this way. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Again, we read fragrant offering, sacrifice to God. What does this all mean? Well, looking back to this idea of a pleasing aroma or a pleasing fragrance, an offering, a sacrifice, takes us back to another time when God's wrath was poured out and was on display. Back in Genesis chapter 8, starting in verse 20, the flood subsides. And then we read this, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. So just try to visualize the total chaos and destruction being enacted by God's wrath in that single event. The broad scope of wiping out everything on earth, save eight people and a bunch of animals in an ark. God takes sin and the transgression against his holy nature very, very serious. These sins, which must be propitiated, the demands of God's righteous anger towards wrath must be satisfied. They have to be satisfied. So, what is sin? The Westminster Confession of Faith puts it this way. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God, and, con and contrary thereunto, doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God and curse of the law and so made subject to death with all miseries spiritual, temporal and eternal this sin the Bible speaks of is universal meaning everyone and everybody in here is a sinner everyone and every body in here was born into Adam Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that is Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. We are sinners by nature. We were even conceived in sin. Psalm 51. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There is no escaping sin. We are all sinners destined for hell and judgment. We, for eternity, will endure the just payment for our iniquities and transgressions against the Holy God, apart from Christ. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, to hammer this point home, Psalm 14 Verses 1 through 3, they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. 
They have all turned aside. Together they have come, become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. And that's repeated again in Psalm 53, verses 1 through 3. Same formulation. So what is the payment for this sin that we've all incurred? Paul in Romans succinctly put it, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. So how do you know that you're all sinners and I'm not just making this up? We all die. Whether from a car wreck, natural cause, COVID, any other form of death, we die because we are sinners. And if that were not enough, the death is intensified by God's righteous judgment on evil deeds. Listen to this graphic imagery that we're given in the book of Isaiah, chapter 63. Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Bozrah? Bozrah. He who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red? And why are your garments like his who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their life's blood splattered on my garments." Kind of reminiscent of a priest after a day of sacrificing animals covered in head to toe in blood. Their lifeblood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart. And my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on earth. This picture of the wine press was described again by John in Revelation 19. As Christ, the warrior king, judges the world at his second coming. Same imagery with the blood splattered garments. So, we're sinners. We're born into sin. We can't escape that reality. And we are destined for hell. Okay, well, what now? What about this atonement that I was speaking about earlier? Anybody ready to hear about that? Anybody ready to hear some good news? I've given you the evidences of why we need a Savior. Or what necessitates the atonement. Not that God was obligated to do anything, but God in His mercy and grace in eternity past planned the most beautiful plan of redemption. He would not allow His people to remain in their sins. And He would put forth His Son as a propitiation for our sins. His son would die a horrific death, voluntarily that is, on behalf of his people on a cross, satisfying the demands of God's holiness. Back to Romans 5, chapter 12, or chapter 5, verse 12 and following. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, again, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that man, one, one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, Death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, 
So one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. He, the author of Hebrews in chapter 2 verse 9 puts it this way, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, Christ, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. So what God did through the humiliation, humiliation of Jesus Christ was perfectly consistent with his sovereign righteousness and holiness. Without this humiliation, without this suffering, without Christ's atoning work on the cross, there could be no redemption. Did you catch that back in verse 10 in Hebrews? For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Another way to say founder is originator. This atoning work of Christ, this, this sacrifice, this redemption, this salvation that we have is in Christ Jesus, who is the originator. Jesus, through his obedience to the will of the Father, purchased our salvation by his atoning sacrifice on the cross for his people. You might be asking at this moment, you really mean to say that it was the will of God that his son would die a horrific death on the cross? And that is emphatically yes. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. So yes, it was his will to crucify his son, his only begotten son. And praise be to he for such. His mercy and grace that we now get to enjoy as believers by this work of, uh, by this work of Christ on the cross. Romans 3, verse 21 and following. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So this was foreordained. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his, in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins, not diminishing his justice in any way. You can look at it another way by passing over his former, the former sins he is heaping up wrath. We are heaping up wrath for that day of judgment. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The justice, the wrath, and the holiness of God satisfied in our Redeemer, Christ. So Christ's death on the cross, again, atoned for our sins cleared our consciences. 
took away our guilt and gave us new life. And in one day, we will spend an eternity in the presence of his glory, and we will be transfixed by his wounds that will serve as a reminder to us what Christ endured on our behalf. To summarize this, <clears throat> all that I've said, I hope I haven't confused y'all up until this point, but to, uh, to summarize it, I'll put it this way, and hopefully this succinctly puts it. We deserve to die as a penalty for sin. One. Two, we deserve to bear God's wrath against sin. Three, we are separated from God by our sins. And four, we are in bondage to sin and to the kingdom of Satan. So that's what necessitates the atonement. How are these met in Christ? Well, the penalty for sin is death, Christ's sacrifice. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews 9, Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 26. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So again, we deserve to die as the penalty for sin. That's met in Christ by his sacrifice, as indicated in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. We deserve to bear God's wrath against sin. That's met in Christ by his propitiation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. The Apostle John says this, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, and that is comforting. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. To be a propitiation for our sins, to satisfy, to turn away the wrath of God onto his son at the cross so that we didn't have to bear that. What a good shepherd we serve. Three, we are separated from God to, from God by our sins. That's met in Christ by reconciliation. I read uh, that earlier in Second uh, Corinthians chapter five, eighteen through nineteen. I'll go ahead and read it again for y'all. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So turning, propitiating God, satisfying his holy demands upon his law and his holiness. Those, are, those trespasses weren't counted against us. They were imputed to Christ on the cross. And then in turn, Christ's righteousness is imputed to us in that great exchange. And then lastly, four, we are in bondage to sin in the kingdom of Satan. And that's met in Christ by how? Redemption. Turn with us, or turn with me rather, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul says here, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So, I hope by this little small uh, sermon that we now have a little broader sense of what the atonement means, how it's applied to our lives as Christians. Uh, when we read and study diligently in God's word, of the sacrifice of the shed blood of our Savior, it will, and I can say this with full confidence, if you diligently study this subject, it will give you 
a certain peace if you're in a time of trial, if uh, you are finding yourself longing for that sweet, genuine fellowship that you had maybe first in your conversion where you're red hot for God and, um, and through, you know, some time you begin to wane. The atonement and that in the in the study and the blood and his sacrifice, his cross, his, the way he propitiated for us, the way he turned God's wrath away from us, the way that we've seen God's wrath played out in Scripture, and what we know is to come on those who remain unrepentant. It will embolden you. It will give you a great peace, a great sense of joy and love, and admiration for our Lord. Uh, so that's all I got at this time. Uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions. And, uh, and well, let me actually, before that, I'll give you a little bit of my testimony. So uh, with me here tonight is my wife, Kaylee Jackson, and our three sons, Meridian uh, Jackson, Dawson Jackson, and Grady Quinn Jackson. Uh, we have been married since uh, 2012. And uh, I'm not good at math, so I'm not going to try to do that math off the top of my head. But uh, anyways, um, we, I was baptized at the age of 10, um, but know for certain that I was not a true uh, believer. Uh, pretty much rebelled against God until I was 30. And when I say rebel against God, I mean fulfilled all that... Um, a sinner could do and to its nth degree. Um, nearly died several times. Um, there's no telling how many times I put myself in, in harm's way and somehow by the grace of God, he has delivered me here this night to uh, preach behind this pulpit. Um, I have all the glory to God and I know that he was sovereign in my salvation and I know that it was only a work and power of him that brought me from darkness into light. But I do have folks in this congregation who I owe uh, a lot of my gratitude towards, and they were instrumental in my salvation. Uh, my sister and brother-in-law, Scott, um, they stuck with me during you know, my deepest and darkest uh, days. Uh, they constantly... Uh, talked about Christ with me. They annoyed me uh, as um, anyone who's walking in darkness and is hostile to the things of God and is an enemy of God would be. Um, every time I was over there, they were constantly interjecting the gospel into every conversation we had. And that is quite annoying and abrasive to somebody who doesn't want to hear it. But they remained faithful. So a good uh, lesson to be learned by them. Uh, but I do remember one night, uh, Ashley uh, pricked my conscience, if you will, uh, with hitting me with a Luke 14 passage. And she was talking about, if you don't hate your brother, your sister, your mother, uh, and um, if you don't hate your brother, sister, or your mother, then you can't be a disciple of mine, uh, Jesus said. And I just thought, that is radical. Um, you really mean to tell me that I'm going to, it's going to appear that I hate you, uh, if I were to uh, then be in union with Christ and walk with him. She was like, yes, absolutely. I thought, wow, that is crazy. So, uh, but again, she stuck with me. Um, and then uh, Kaylee and I, I won't go into any details, but we had a little bit of a falling out. And um, I went over to Ashley and Scott's house and I, I laid bare a little bit about what I was going through. And I said, I failed everything in life. I wanted to be a professional baseball player, got to college, partied my way out of that. Uh, wanted to be a musician, partied my way out of that. I, I barely passed college. It, you know, just all these things that I either did mediocre or, or would just fall short and give up and go on to the next thing, clean my hands of it. I told Ashley, I said, I do not want to fail at being a husband or a father. And that's when uh, Ashley graciously said, here's uh, John MacArthur sermon series on the Fulfilled Family Sermon. And I was working out of town at the time. I listened to the first sermon. And I remember 
at this moment in my life, I'm listening to a lot of different philo philosophers, uh, you know, all who are not Christian by any stretch of the imagination, but just trying to really figure out who I was and what, you know, this life meant. And I popped in that sermon, and I remember thinking every question that I've ever had in regards to what it means to be a man, father, husband, was answered in that sermon. And, I, you know, it wasn't like aha or anything, but I felt a little, you know, kind of like in a daze, kind of, you know, well, that's weird, you know. How is it that it answered every question? So, uh, fast forward to that Friday. I go do what I normally did. I went and played golf, uh, and I... Uh, I, 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 I drank too much and then, you know, um, woke up the next day and Kaylee heard the same story uh, that she's always heard before. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll never drink again. She said, yeah, whatever. And then from that moment, uh, I don't know why in the grace of God, and I'll wonder this forever, but I think that he allowed me to do that one more time to see how quickly I was blinded by the things of this world. And... Um, and I just remember diving into my Bible, and I couldn't stop. And uh, and still to this day, I, I, I have a longing and, and yearning to, to know more about God, to study his word, uh, to serve my king. I uh, It's been a blessing being at this church. Uh, my brother Jacob Tyser has mentioned this before. We get fed a lot here at this church. And uh, that is the truth. Uh, Pastor Blaine and all of our elders are very faithful when they get behind this pulpit and they preach the word of God and they do it faithfully. And it is, uh, it is a joy being in the fellowship of this church. Everybody here, all the familiar faces that I see, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all you, all you ladies right here, it's, just, it, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a blessing to be here. And I and I, when I when I miss you know Sundays for work or you know we have a sick child or something I, I long and, and 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 miss to be back in fellowship with this church. I have a great support group, great family that uh, that are here. A lot of them come to this church, and um, they have been again instrumental in my salvation and then also instrumental in my sanctification. And um, they are good, uh, godly people, and you would do well to uh, meet them. Uh, I owe a lot to my wife as well, who uh, most certainly keeps me within um, godly parameters. Uh, anyways, I am thankful and overjoyed that this congregation would see it fit that I would be an elder here. And um, I will have a concern and deep reverence for the worship that goes on in this church. Uh, I want to see this church be doctrinally and biblically sound, uh, yet missional, uh, caring for others in our community, um, caring for each other uh, when we have folks who don't come to church for a uh, time. And uh, we, I, I long to see those folks, and I, need to, I know I need to meet them and go minister to them and ask them how they're doing. And that's a supernatural love. I mean, outside of church let's, and outside of the fellowship and union with Christ, I, I to be quite honest with you, I, I, I hope this doesn't sound mean, but I, I probably wouldn't have anything to do with you. But since we are in union with Christ and we are a body of believers, I, 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 can't, I can't explain it. It was one of those moments in my life and testimony that I, I could honestly say, this is for real. I... I know what I'm reading about when I read about Christ, who he is, the God-man dying for me, Matt Jackson in Maypearl, Texas. Um, I, I started to really understand that when I got around uh, the members here at Oak Crest. And I, you can just tell when, you, when you're in the presence of another believer, you don't want to be away from them. So it, uh, again, uh, all that to say, I, I really am overjoyed and, 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 and prayerful that I would be faithful to this congregation 
and uh, fulfilling the role uh, of an elder if that be y'all's wishes and that I would do it faithfully, humbly, and, uh, and just be a plowman. Any questions? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for, yet again, your faithfulness that I don't understand, your grace that I don't fully understand, your mercy that I just quite can't understand, why you would bestow all that to me, to these people, but you have. Therefore, we bow before you humbly, knowing that we didn't do anything to deserve any of this, but knowing that you're bringing a people to your son, that you're building your church, that you called me to be a part of, called these folks to be a part of, is the greatest gift that I could ever receive. And if I don't receive anything else, so be it. I'll always have the glorious gospel to look back on, to know what I've been redeemed from, and to praise your name. And Lord, I hope that is the heart of every believer in this congregation. As Blaine has said from this pulpit, we never graduate from the gospel. The gospel is glorious. The gospel is life. And we wish we had words to express our gratitude and our love for you. The Father, just be with us again as we go out into the world into the mission field, into the battlefield. And if you do return, find us being faithful, doing what is pleasing in your sight, mortifying the sin that Christ paid for on the cross that still remains in our life until our glorification. And all this by the work of your power and Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray.